introduce uh, Dr. Ab El Saeed. Uh, he goes by Dr. Al, in case you're struggling with the last name. So uh, he's an anesthesiologist uh, here at UW uh, who, who focuses on pain management, um, pain modulation. Uh, he's the director, uh, medical director at the uh, pain center. Um, he, he's gonna, uh, he's been here since 2014. He's, he's gonna um, uh, be giving us a talk today about neuromodulation, um, uh, uh, particularly speaking about uh, peripheral nerve stimulators, uh, which are uh, uh, newer, newer technologies. So we're interested to hear what he has to say. So thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Al, for taking the time. I really appreciate that. Uh, we all do. Uh, and and uh, let's see if we can get your screen to share here. Sure. First of all, uh, uh, thank you so much for, all for having me, and it's a pleasure always to um, to see you and work with you. Neurosurgery is one of the closest departments to my heart. It's been fantastic support for uh, my my team and my leadership and building the PIM program. So I'm very grateful to all of you. And today I'll I'll try here just to share my screen. So one second. All right. Everybody can see my screen here. We sure can. Okay, very good. So, so I'll be talking here, and I'll promise you I'll keep it to the thirty minutes. Uh, so we, uh, I know you're all busy going to the OR, but we will talk about neuromodulation. And when I thought about what we talk about the neuromodulation, uh, we will talk about uh, some analysis of new waveforms that are, um, I'd say, the modern science of neuromodulation, as well as some advances in peripheral nervous stimulation. So. Here we'll discuss the uh, different waveforms. So before in the past, we always had like uh, the one waveform or the one uh, form of a stimulation that we use, but now there are too many others. And we will discuss peripheral nervous stimulation, which is really the evolving uh, technology in neuromodulation. And we will talk about some updates on the mechanism of action, uh, which also was found in the recent years. And uh, before, you know, before I start, I want to make it clear, neuromodulation is never a first option for patients. It always a last resort when patient um, either uh, had a surgery which improved everything but the pain continues or patient who's not eligible for surgery tried all medications all kind of injection this is literally the patient that will show up in 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 the clinic saying you know do something or i'll kill myself I'm, i tried everything else uh, and that's why actually i send your way a lot of patients who will um, Make sure first they are not surgical candidate before we try this. So this is a last resort. Also, we will talk about how nice the technology is, but it is always a last resort for the patient. So just a quick background here, and I'll focus. So chronic low back pain affects a significant number of patients, and that's not news to all of you. But also it leads to a significant disability, immobility, and poor quality of life. Uh, so it's more than 6 million patients in the United States alone are currently dealing with chronic uh, back pain. And as I speak about now with the chronic pain, I'll focus on the back pain, which again, 6 million is a large uh, number, but think uh, there, there is neck pain, there is pelvic pain, there is abdominal pain, there is all other kinds of pain uh, that, uh, I mean, you can, I think the millions will keep adding up that you will find a big portion of the US and worldwide population uh, are in some sort of chronic pain, which again can be treated by neuromodulation. Uh, so here is, um, again, the, the neuromodulation is not actually spinal cord stimulation for low back pain. It's not a new technology. Uh, it's been proven for a long time. And uh, as I recall very well reading the history, first implant was done at UW uh, by a neurosurgeon, uh, I think in the 60s. Uh, so I was preparing one day, Grand Rounds was one of my residents, and that's what we found out. So UW has been one of the leading institutes in neuromodulation over the years. And uh, so, yeah, so the neuro, if you look here at this slide again, so basically uh, uh, for our maybe uh, juniors is that it's basically put the spinal cord stimulator leads behind the spinal cord in the epidural space uh, to stimulate the, um, uh, the sensory tracts, basically blocking the pain from transmission from the low back and legs up to the brain. So the gate theory uh, is the main theory we believe in, but there are many other theories about how they work. And in recent years, there have been significant evolution in the in the waveforms. So if you look at the, I mean, conventional, it's basically the stimulators that we uh, we had all the time uh, since the old days, which they, they deliver the same um, stimulation to the spinal cord. But then people started talking about high frequency stimulations and the 10,000 10, hertz, and people started talking about burst stimulation. Uh, so stimulation that go in bursts 
uh, and um, they started to to kind of compare uh, the the waveforms and their impact on the spinal cord stimulator and on pain management. So this is actually. Uh, one of um, um, uh, studies uh, performed by uh, my team, it's in, in press right now and soon to be published, uh, where we gathered everything published on waveforms. And I, th I thought it would be a good conclusion for our discussion today. Uh, so we, we looked at everything comparing the waveforms to each other, tonic versus burst, tonic versus high frequency, and high frequency versus burst. And these are the three main waveforms, kind of in neuromodulation as we speak. And uh, as you see here, we went through, we found hundreds of articles, but then we ended up with uh, 11 articles uh, that really qualified um, being uh, clinical trials or large prospective studies or meta-analyses uh, that uh, gave us some information about uh, those comparisons. And again, as I discussed, I don't think there is like the wow waveform, I would say, or the one that really beats all the others, but definitely as we, we read those articles and um, go through conclusions, I think the idea here is to trigger, yes, there, are, there is really difference between the waveforms and there is um, there is more to the science in that than we think, uh, but which one is the best, I think will continue to be a matter of debate for a while, but um, uh, I think it just needs to be customized to the patient. So as we discuss what's published, I want you to know that again, we don't have too many studies, uh, but definitely there is something there. And here is like our table when we did this, uh, the bias um, uh, evaluation. As you can see, a lot of them, the bias was unknown by uh, when we did our like uh, scaling. So as I mentioned, there is something there, there's something about the waveforms, but I think which one is the best is kind of still a matter of debate. So here is when we compared, for example, the burst to the tonic. And again, if I show up a table, this means we found just more trials and more evidence that we could do uh, meta analysis and statistic analysis for. In some other comparisons, we didn't have enough data, good quality data to perform the same uh, comparisons. But here shows burst to tonic. Uh, we have um, five studies. And if you look at the mean pain score, this is a number I wanted to look at for burst versus tonic. After implementation of a stimulation, you can see that um, the uh, mean pain score for burst waveforms were, were lower than uh, when compared to, to the tonic uh, within the um, uh, within the study uh, and the, the difference was significant so this clinical uh, those clinical trials claim that burst waveform could be more effective than tonic waveform and here are like also some summary when we uh, looked at high frequency versus tonic and i'm here trying to compare versus tonic to um, to basically show the, the newer forms compared to the uh, older uh, tonic stimulation form. And again, the studies keep going. If you look at uh, those older prospective studies, patient uh, was naive. When I mean by naive, they didn't have stimulation before. That was their first attempt. Sample size actually were decent between like 72, 171 patients and 55 patients. And duration of follow-up was up to two years on that slide. Uh, and if you look here, the first one showed uh, there is some existent evidence that HF uh, favorability is superior, but again, not clearly established. Uh, the second study here by uh, DeAndres uh, showed no meaningful difference between tonic and HF10. And uh, with the one by Capral at 24 months, there was greater response rate for HF10 therapy relative to tonic stimulation. And the tables here will keep going when we compare now burst to uh, high frequency, which is a two. I would say my most recent uh, waveforms we use in neuromodulation. Uh, the thing here, you know, uh, again, filled back surgical syndrome, uh, patients are naive. The number is pretty low, actually 16 patients. Uh, that's why even, I mean, the, the findings here, like uh, whether superior or non-inferior, I feel the number is pretty, uh, pretty small. And the follow-up here, again, if you look at all those studies, uh, the previous slide, uh, the, large, the, 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 the most lengthy one was 24 months. Here is up to one year, and I think really up to one year is not very indicative uh, of non-inferiority of one modality versus another. So that's why I'm, I'm, you know, as I say, yeah, there is something there. There is new waveforms, and there may be some um, efficacy, but I don't believe we have this large, gigantic, good study that can, uh, um, I'd say, uh, seal the deal about which waveform to use. Uh, one of the one of the mechanisms actually that were uh, found out recently, and that's something uh, I think this is really the main thing to talk about here today, is that I mean comparing burst to tonic, 
So the, uh, as, you, as you see here, burst and tonic, they don't only stimulate the spinal cord, but they found that the stimulation extends to the, um, uh, the brain and to the central nervous system. Uh, so they, uh, and they measured the, actually those potentials in animals, and the, there is one human study uh, done in Italy. So they did measure the potentials to confirm um, the, the stimulation of, um, of the brain centers. If you look here between burst and tonic, uh, the stimulation actually goes up to the brain. Um, so the dotted line here shows that, you know, it doesn't reach that high or not that strong, but on the left side, the, when you see the burst of stimulation, the solid, uh, like, red line here shows you that there's some stimulation, actually, that the device can um, initiate into the brain centers. Uh, and this is very important as we speak, because those brain centers are the ones that control catastrophizing emotional pain and not only the physical pain. So we always thought when you do spinal cord stimulator, you put it at the back of the spinal cord, and then you uh, block the pain by the gate theory. But measuring more potential, they found, actually, that it does impact the catastrophizing and the emotional pain. And that's why, I mean, when I, when I was in my training and we do a spinal cord stimulation and you find the patient coming very happy, smiling, you start questioning, you know, that's too good to be true. Um, but he, it, it seems actually that the stimulation can extend up to the brain to reduce catastrophizing, uh, reduce emotional pain, uh, and actually improve uh, personality and perception of pain, not only just by blocking the uh, sensory receptors. And this is one of the nice studies, actually, which measured the um, uh, measured the, the um, actually the uh, stimulation in brain uh, by uh, when they did stimulation. And as you see here uh, in um, in the uh, trying to yeah, so if you look here at at uh, A, that's they found significant increase in premotor and uh, supplementary motor cortex activity. Uh, during tonic stimulation when com compared to baseline. So you find actually there is more stimulation in the brain uh, when, you, when you perform stimulation. And there, uh, in, in number B here, you find significant increase in neural activity where observed in premotor cortex, supplementary motor cortex, and dorsal cingulate uh, cortex activity during burst stimulation when compared to baseline. And in number C here, also you will see significant increase in neural activity were observed in the uh, sensory motor anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate cortex during burst stimulation when compared to stonic stimulation. Uh, and there was a decrease, on the other hand, in the neural activity in the anterior cingulate cortex during burst stimulation. And again, that's the part that controlled catastrophizing. So basically, increase stimulation in areas that, uh, uh, you know, in, in enhance inhibition of pain and decrease uh, in the, uh, I'd say, in the charges of the areas that control catastrophizing. So, which can, uh, which can justify why some of the patients will just show up and have all this uh, decrease in, um, in, in, in pain or improvement in mood and decrease in emotional pain. All right, so speaking of all of this, uh, as we spoke and the science has been evolving on uh, the uh, spinal cord stimulation and the waveform. There was this new talk now about actually the um, closed loop versus uh, open loop uh, spinal cord stimulation. So all the system I just talked about are closed loop, uh, are, sorry, are open. Um, uh, uh, so basically they stimulate the spinal cord in one way. And then some new scientists found that, uh, yeah, but the CSF moves and then the stimulation and the leads will move uh, close and far from the spinal cord, which will change the stimulation and the pain control uh, uh, for the patient. And again, all the available spinal cord stimulator systems are open loop systems, and the, so they do not really just they're open loop. They just stimulate the spinal cord, and they don't measure the change in electrical activity in the spinal cord. So you deliver the stimulation. But you don't know, so that's kind of the, the, the sending part. You don't know what is the receiving part in the spinal cord is having. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the, the, they claim this is, you know, like can uh, cause inhibition, but again, it's unpredictable as the leads move right and left and uh, back and forth from the spinal cord. So um, again, having a, a closed loop system uh, that can change the stimulation and output needed depending on the uh, 
and measuring the potentials in the spinal cord seems like a good idea. So there are actually new uh, stimulators. They are even approved in Europe right now, I think, in their way to the U.S., uh, where actually they have closed the loop spinal cord stimulators that interact with the spinal cord. So they are able to measure the stimulation of the spinal cord and then through an algorithm, the spinal cord will change the stimulation uh, accordingly. So if, the, if, if it's weak stimulation, they will increase the output. If it's strong, they will reduce the output. And it, uh, those systems will adjust for the CSF movement, which drive the leads um, far and close to the spinal cord with the spinal cord with the CSF movement. And the leads then will adjust their stimulation accordingly. So yeah, with, with this, I just wanted to, you know, today to trigger with you what, what we all are thinking about neuromodulation and, uh, you know, how it's evolving between the uh, new waveforms now to the closed loop stimulation. Uh, and uh, again, we'll see, I think, more and more advancement as we go, and we will learn more and more about the science uh, as we go. Other indication, as I mentioned before, so that's only we talked about uh, focus on the low back pain, but neuromodulation now can be used for neck pain, for uh, cervical radicular pain, thoracic back pain, pelvic pain, abdominal pain, functional, and other functional indications. And and one of the, the reasons why we could use it in more indications now, really, in my opinion, is having more waveforms and more options. Because we did find I in like I performed some in pelvic pain and abdominal pain and, and all of those indication. And I found really that some of the new waveforms work better than the old waveforms in certain indications. I find in my personal experience they do not differ in other in the routine indications. So there is again something here. Uh, the most importantly also is to mention that uh, now many, many waveforms you can place a battery of one brand on the leads of another brand. Uh, which can actually, uh, what we call it the salvage therapy, so can provide a different mode of stimulation that can, rather than just redoing the whole surgery, just replace the battery, and then you deliver a whole new uh, waveform uh, that can uh, help pain. And uh, there are studies out there that shows that the body can get used of one form of stimulation, and that can justify decrease the efficacy in some patients over the year. And, and and they were actually larger studies to some extent. And when they replaced the battery with a different waveform or a different system, they found that the patients gained back efficacy. Um, so I don't know, I always resemble it to the opioid rotation when patients use certain one type of opioids and they develop tolerance, and then you change the type of opioids to another one so you can have uh, uh, reduce the tolerance and go on lower doses. So it seems to be a similar mechanism here that the body develop tolerance to certain waveform until it changes. And again, something we do see, uh, um, and it's important to keep in mind. And again, all our last options, if you find a patient who benefits from the spinal cord for five years and come all of a sudden to is not working and you don't see any anatomical problems, it's, it might be worth it to change the battery to a different brand and just see if you get efficacy. And I have done it for multiple patients and I am, I've seen it uh, that we regain some efficacy uh, this way. So another good option, the more we have technologies, the more we have waveforms, the more we have options for our patients. And now I'll just briefly, I'll talk in the next few slides about peripheral nerve stimulation, which I, I, this is really the evolving thing in, in neuromodulation. It's growing very fast. And as we all know, it has a high need in the field. Uh, uh, so I will categorize it into two systems here. The conventional systems we always used uh, have been used um, in, in peripheral nerve stimulation. There has been studies and uh, we have used them in patients whenever we could get uh, approval for the cases. And there have been some studies out there that were uh, where we place the regular spinal cord stimulator systems uh, on peripheral nerves. It has been done by surgeons, by surgical incisions, been done by uh, pain physicians uh, by using ultrasound or X-ray. Uh, so the, the technology here is not, it's not new. But the new thing about it is now that we have the wireless systems. So the wireless systems are uh, nice in that you place only the lead next to the nerve, which typically requires some ultrasound skills. So you can see the nerve, place the lead uh, on the nerve, and then you use an external generator. So you don't have to implant a battery or a generator. You just put the uh, lead out there and then the generator, which are very small, light, and um, uh, really easy to use. You put it outside uh, on the lead from the outside or at certain part of the lead from the outside. To deliver the energy. So this way, uh, it's really much less extensive procedure. It requires just almost one centimeter incision to place the lead. Of course, there are different brands out there 
uh, and the all are different. Some are smaller than others, but there are some brands that have regular leads as uh, we use four contacts going to eight contacts, delivering strong stimulation. And some of those systems are temporary, so they are approved just to be in the body for, uh, for example, up to 60 days, and some of them are permanent. Uh, and with the temporary system, they have some small scale studies that show um, prolonged efficacy after removal within the 60 days, and the permanent system you just keep in the body uh, after placement. So again, very, very uh, nice technology, and some of those brands actually can be used for spinal cord stimulation. Uh, so, and I have used uh, for a couple of my patients where you can't really uh, place a battery because if either the patient is uh, doesn't have enough subcutaneous tissue to place a battery, or it will be uh, inappropriate for certain patients like paraplegic patients who have constant pressure in their backs. So, uh, so those wireless system are going for not only the peripheral but also for spinal cord stimulation. Again, as we go, it will be just multiple options, um, and. Um, uh, again, you can customize the option to the patient. So here again, the uh, the leads are placed and the target. Uh, of course, there are challenges that you have the energy travel between the external generator and the lead, but they are actually effective, and we find that the patient do feel the stimulation as we place them. I'll just show up here a few cases I did here at UW. So this one uh, patient had sural neuralgia. Again, after failure of everything, here I place the lead on the sural nerve under ultrasound, and then I take an X-ray picture, all just to uh, keep some baseline uh, to detect any migration in the future. And you can see here the contacts are down there, and then you have the chips up here in the lead itself. So that's basically the chip. This is a battery here. Uh, when you put an external, uh, so the external energy source will interact with those chips and stimulate the contacts here to stimulate the nerve. Uh, was a very successful case. And that's a case where I did ilioinguinal uh, nerve uh, stimulation, uh, just placing the leads at the ilioinguinal uh, nerve. And uh, so this is kind of basically you can look at any nerve in the body and just to place the leads next to that nerve. And then um, that's it. You've just placed the leads. So that's why it's much less invasive uh, and uh, much more convenient, easy to explain if um, after a certain number of years the condition is not there. Uh, so I'd say much less work than placing a battery, uh, and most importantly, if uh, you know, and, and the challenge in peripheral nervous stimulation sometimes where was where to put the battery, because for example, this case I showed up up here, I put the sural nerve. My option here, if I use a conventional system, is to put the battery in the calf or so, which can be um, hard for the patient to just live with the battery down there. So. You can cut the leads, you can make them shorter, you can, so there is, and again, the brands are the several now in the market and you can use any of them to customize to the patient. Uh, and so it made that challenge much less for peripheral nerves. I think really the challenge for peripheral nerves now is really the use of ultrasound, not the device itself, because the device is very easy to place anywhere in the body. And by this, I finished kind of the, the part of neuromodulation. And just as you've been always my partner in this, I'll just update you on the pain program in one slide here. So right now the pain program at 1102 South Park Street uh, have six pain physicians between rehab and anesthesiologists. Um, uh, we work very in, in a multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, we have two advanced pain practitioners, three physical therapists, three pain psychologists. Uh, we have two pain fellows. We have a psychiatrist uh, trained in MSK. We have an addiction MD, addiction psychologist. We do EMGs, uh, ultrasound procedures. We have a lidocaine infusion center. Uh, and again, the, the scope of pain management um, has expanded beyond really the treating back pain. I know some of you are spine surgeons, some are uh, do cranies, and we uh, we interact with many other surgeons at UW, but really we treat pain head to toe, starting with headache. We work with podiatrists on foot pain, with surgeons on the inguinal pain, abdominal pain, and of course with all of you as spine surgeons on the back pain. Uh, and as you see, the concept of, uh, you know, either liking injection or medications is kind of more of uh, how the practice has been going all over the country in, in the past decades, but with the recent uh, development of multidisciplinary nature uh, and the need for multiple. So some of those patients will come to our clinic, will just go to the pain psychologist or to the physical therapist. They will not require any injections or pills from us. Some of them will go for opioid weaning with the addiction psychologist and our addiction MD. Uh, so, providing a lot of variety, a lot of options for patient. Um, so, I mean, having all of those uh, providers under one roof is actually very unique to our program. And 
uh, looking at our program right now, I think one of the biggest programs in the US means of volumes of quality and having all those providers. And again, thanks to all of you for supporting our mission. Since I came in 2014, the neurosurgery department has been always on my back, always backing me up, always helping me. So I'm grateful to all of you and we couldn't do it without you to achieve the size of practice. We're always uh, happy to see your patients. But then my goal here is to show you that uh, really pain is not anymore about an answer in an injection or a pill. It's way beyond uh, this. And uh, having all those people work together, make it uh, make the outcomes much better. And that's what we see, that we see our patients um, really um, much happier. We have much better outcomes. We have a big improvement. We have a very good reputation that tracked patients from all over, uh, from the states all over around us. And uh, by this, um, uh, again, these are all the things uh, here at UW Health. So I, I talked about the pain clinic at 1102, which is, I call it the mothership here. But if you look at the pain program at UW here, we have the uh, pain clinic, we have the procedures at MSC, we have the acute pain team at the hospital and tech. We have the inpatient pain consult and that their pager in case you need them, the 1010. Uh, three nurse practitioners are always available to help with any inpatient consults. Uh, we're developing a very nice uh, program at Children's Acute, Chronic, and Inpatient, and we do have providers and mid-levels and a psychologist to help all those areas. And then we have the regional clinics for uh, our uh, future expansion and the cancer pain. So again, expanding as a very good practice, and I encourage you to utilize it when you need it on the inpatient or outpatient service, and more will be coming hopefully in the next few years. Um, and yeah, and these are some references I used in uh, in preparing this presentation. That's my email address. Please feel free to reach out to me if uh, you have any question, collaboration and research, if you need a patient to get in quickly because it's urgent. Uh, and uh, as I promised, I kept my talk here to 30 minutes, 29 minutes. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, from anyone. Thanks, Al. Thank Thanks. you very much for uh, for talking. Thanks for doing thanks for doing what you do because these are tough patients. Thank um, you. The question I have for you is: um, I've been somewhat frustrated with the state of the literature regarding the, the, these new technologies. Um, it seems that every industry-sponsored study is positive, and every independent study is not positive, and, and, and it gets gets a little bit ag aggravating. And what really aggravates me is the uh, is the um, the explant rate of these things is so high, and they're so expensive. Um, any, any, any indication of whether these new technologies will, you mentioned changing out stimulation parameters as, as perhaps a means to extend the life of these yeah. things. I mean, yes, are, I, yeah, but I completely actually agree with everything you said. That's why at the beginning I told you, you know, we wouldn't have the WOW study that will show up this uh, device work better than others. But I think the appropriate way, and that's how we do it here, we have a very extensive uh, uh, program to qualify a patient for a spinal cord stimulator. So we have psychologists who deny the patient for any psychological reason, like very aggressive. Uh, we, I will tell the patient right away, we will wean down your opioid to zero if you if you get an implant. So this way I know that I have a patient who will work with me uh, when the patient say yes to this. So it's a motivated patient. Then we will have a lot of education and then we will customize. So we don't follow really any of this literature other than we notice that certain types of um, of waveforms work better than others for certain conditions. Uh, and that's why our explant rate is actually not not high. It happens, but not high. And majority of our patient continues. I think you're right. Some people abuse using the device. And that's what leads to the bad outcome. Some of people just want to implant without really selecting their patient carefully. Uh, but again, time will tell over uh, over the years. But again, it's a last resort, and that's very important. That's a patient that again, there is nothing else we can do for, so that we never push it on patients early in the treatment scale. So I guess that's the best we can know of knowledge right now as we evolve learning about those devices. There's one more quick question. Uh, do you have any like registries going or anything like that? You're following the patients to see what what the medium and long longer terms of outcomes are. We have lots of lot of lots of literature at three and six months, but it's really the one. It's really the two years that um, you know be great to see. Yes, yeah. actually, then you're reading my mind here. So uh, after extensive work, I was able to become a principal investigator in the Medtronic registry, uh, which carries thousands of cases over like several years and decades. And we will be actually meeting for the first time maybe next month to look into data from the previous years. And that will be, of course, it's one brand. Uh, but at least it will give us over the years the data on explants and efficacy. And uh, through that registry, we do have our own data that uh, we can look at every now and then to see our outcomes. So that, yeah, I mean, when I came, I tried to develop our own 
uh, database, but as you know, at UW can be challenging with all the other uh, priorities. <laughs> uh, all right. And so, lawyers uh, too, yeah, exactly. But I tried actually, I made the request several times, but we were, we were lucky to get into this uh, bigger database, which is national, that can help us to understand our numbers and compare to others. And really, when I look at our numbers compared to the nation, we have like almost like really our complications are very low migrations, very low. Everything is very low compared to national average. But we will be looking into this very soon to get years of data. And that's a very good point you triggered here. It was a pleasure working with you. And again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. With me. Hey, Al, I got a question uh, <laughs> yeah. for you. This is Amgen. Uh, for a um, great talk, uh, for nerve stimulation, how do you choose between ablation and stimulation, especially for something like the sural nerve, mm -hmm. which we, we harvest all the time for biopsy or graft? If you can tell us how do you choose? So actually, I do both for uh, for the peripheral nerves, like both 3D frequency and uh, peripheral stimulation, I would say mainly. Uh, so I, it's really, first of all, we do the frequency, radio frequency. The radio frequency works for six months to a year. We just repeat as needed. But if a patient, we do the radio frequency, come tell me, oh, it works for three months. You know, we don't repeat it unless six months goes by. So when the radio frequency works for a short duration, that's when we start offering the peripheral nerve stimulation. But if the radio frequency works for six months to a year, we just stick to the radio frequency. Unless a patient will tell me, you know, I travel four or five hours, I don't keep coming, put something more permanent. But usually in my algorithm, it's radio frequency first. And if it doesn't work as desired, we move to preferred nervous stimulation. Okay. Thank you. Another good question. Thank you. Anthony. So I've got one real quick. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, so this one's more about, um, so I've been doing a lot of reading in the preclinical literature, looking at spinal cord stimulators and their placements. Um, and it seems there's like there's a lot of variability in in where these uh, leads get placed in the epidural space in terms of uh, spinal segment. Um, and then just thinking about the anatomy and and what you mentioned with respect to CSF around the cord and how current is going to you know diffuse around the spinal cord because of the CSF and maybe not penetrate. I wonder if um, placing the leads closer to where the the spinal nerves enter the spinal cord might you know be a potential kind of solution. So I was wondering what your 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 opinion is on that and and and, and placement with regard to trying to stimulate dorsal spine or uh, dorsal column tract or you know spinal roots things along those lines. Uh, ex another excellent question and I wish I had a bigger uh, uh, you know like time to talk but there is the DRG stimulation you know that's where you put it at that dorsal root gangrene stimulate the nerve root and that's a whole actually dilemma of other studies uh, where you place it at the, uh, you literally place it, as you mentioned, through the foramen on the nerve root. If I have one dermatome, and that's been the challenge on the previous systems, is you have one dermatome here and you, then you place stimulate everything. Uh, so now with DRG, you can literally stimulate this single nerve root and get good stimulation. So I agree with you. We, while we don't have the perfect answer, but I think we have way more now options. Uh, compared to the past about uh, waveforms, about where you place them, DRG, peripheral. And again, I think, um, as, as Dr. Dempsey mentioned, we shouldn't follow those studies very closely or take them by heart. That, that's, that's the evidence because they are not. But more kind of try to customize the treatment to our patients. Like I will see a patient and I'll tell them, this brand may work for you. I will give them or I will give them all of them and say, really, I have no preference. Uh, I'll put peripheral nervous stimulation if it's one of the distal nerves because these are very hard to get with uh, conventional stimulation or DRG. But I believe, again, uh, at least we have the options to pick up, as you mentioned. And over time, with experience, you develop some uh, your personal algorithm about uh, what works for whom, and the technology continues to evolve. But another very good question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think anatomy is is hugely important in these in these kinds of things, especially you know when you were talking about medial versus lateral pain pathways, um, you know, because you know you've got one running in uh, anterior spinal thalamic tract versus lateral spinal thalamic tract, and all you know. So anatomy ends up being important in designing technology to to interface with that anatomy the best way possible. I think is essential. Completely. And there are anatomical studies going on right now where they look at the T8-9 for the low back legs, for example. We always place them there as, uh, as uh, by, and then they found that there is more glial cells uh, in those kind of areas. Actually, one of my friends in Illinois was running those studies for years 
uh, on Lishmania that got like a lot of glial cells and they found the highest glial cell densities, the T89, where we place our leaves and he started trying waveforms. So definitely the anatomy is a huge part of uh, how you do those devices. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, Al, you, you got the most the most questions so far this academic year. So great job. All right. Thank you yeah, all. Thanks very much. Uh, stay in touch. Take care. All thank right. you. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.